All right, 1 Kings chapter 17, enough said about that. And then we'll have the sheriff pray for us. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is subtle. This is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. I encourage these guys, Brother Sam and uh, Brother Woodard and Brother Lance, and all these guys that preach here on a regular basis, Brother Russell, I encourage them to use the Old Testament uh, in their preaching, and they do. Uh, I don't know if you realize this or not, but the Lord has blessed us with an abundance of really good preachers here. And uh, as a result, it enables us to do more than just have to be in one place. We're able to be in a multitude, a multiplicity of places in more than one time, oftentimes filling pulpits and other places. It's a tremendous blessing, and so I appreciate them. But I, I encourage them to do that. Often in uh, the Christian life, people spend all their time reading just the New Testament, the New Testament, the New Testament. You miss the riches in the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament has for me a whole lot more stories in there that tend to parallel things in my life and things that go on in life. And I like this particular story right here because of the weakness of the woman, but the faith of the woman. Uh, all throughout the Bible, you see the Lord utilizing or referring to women, even though we tend to make it all male, that uh, he refers to women, and they're women of great faith. This woman, her name is not mentioned. But she has some of the same problems and difficulties that we do. Now, just to give you a speed up before I read the passage to you, now Elijah has been over by the brook Cherith for a little while, and uh, the brook is now dried up. And as a result, he's got a dry hole, and he's got a, a dead spot, and the Lord's telling him, you've got to go somewhere else. And he sends him to a place called Zarephath, and there's a particular person he's looking for in Zarephath. He's looking for a widow, a widow woman there in Zarephath who has a son. And that's where we'll pick up the story. The word of the Lord came to him, verse number 8, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, think about this. During the time that Elijah has been being provided for, the woman has apparently been provided for, though scantily, during the same time he's been by the brook, she has been at the house continuing to do what she's supposed to, but just like the brook dried up, now her, her uh, uh, supply is also drying up. But think about this, during the time of famine, the Lord's speaking to the woman just like he's speaking yeah. to Elijah. Amen. The Lord spoke to her. He said, I, I, the widow woman there to sustain thee. And so he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering sticks. And he called her to said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go and dress it for me. That means to prepare me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make thee for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The bearer of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, unto the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. I like this. And she went and did. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for standing. Sit down, kick your shoes off for just a few minutes and relax. An interesting story in the... Bible, this is the first appearance here of a man named Elijah, and he tells him, I got a message for you, and he gets called out, and he delivers the message, and then the Lord says, now that you've shown yourself, go hide yourself. I mean, first of all, think about the courage that it took for Elijah to go speak to the then known king of all of Israel. He walks in, he's unknown, he's unheard of. The Lord had to have prepared the way for him to even be able to get an audience of the king. And then he walks in there and the king says, you know, what do you want? And he said, uh, the Lord told me to tell you it's not going to rain anymore and see you later. And he leaves. And Elijah says, what do I do now? He said, oh, go over there by the brook Cherith. And he said, I'll provide for you some water and I'll get the ravens to bring you some food and things like that. And you sort of take that for granted. But the Bible said Elijah went and did. 
all that the Lord had commanded him to do. And so what did he do? He went over there by the brook. And I, I don't know if I was that person, I probably would walk out of there and I would be going by the brook every day and think to myself, is that little bit of water going to sustain me? And when is it going to be before that water runs out? And how long I'm, he doesn't tell him how long he's going to be there. See, oftentimes we get accustomed to the provisions of God on a regular basis, so much so that we take them for granted that when we turn the spigot on the next day, the water is going to come on. And the light switch is going to come on. We turn the light. There's the lights. And we get ready to turn on the oven or the stove or whatever it may be. And we go to the refrigerator. We open it up and there's the food. And we go to the closet and there's the clothes there. And we turn on the shower and the hot water comes out. And there's soap that's there and shampoo and shaving razor or whatever you have there and, and that kind of thing. But uh, Elijah had gone accustomed to the fact that when he first went, I'm going to say probably was thinking to himself, I wonder how long I'm going to be here and how long this is going to last. I would imagine that after maybe a year of sitting by the brook and seeing it babble and every day the birds bring and he probably is now thinking not that the birds aren't coming but I wonder what they're going to bring me today. I wonder what house they went by. I wonder whether they went by the king's house and maybe went in there and they got some of the king's food or whatever. But he gets this varied menu on a regular basis. And probably sometimes he's like, well, there's probably food coming tomorrow. I don't really want to eat this food because <laughs> it's not really what I was wanting. I think that probably oftentimes don't we get a bit selective that we're thinking because we know tomorrow's coming and another meal is going to be there. You know, we get kind of selective instead of saying, and Lord, thank you for what you did give me. And sometimes instead of saying that, you know what we do? We tend to say, oh Lord, you know what? Since I know you're going to give me tomorrow, I think I'm just going to bypass the day today. I mean, do you think every day or do you take for granted every day? And this isn't to hammer you. It's just to try to produce a thought process for you for where I'm going. Did you get up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you that I was able to sleep without thieves and robbers breaking in? Lord, thank you for the air conditioning because it didn't drop below 80 last night. Thank you for the lack of humidity so I didn't stick to the sheets while I was sleeping. And thank you that when I went to the restroom this morning that I was able to uh, uh, remove the waste so that my house doesn't smell. I mean, I realize that sounds kind of gross, but if you go to other countries, you realize the direction the wind blows makes a huge difference in how your day goes. I mean, I'm talking people that are not as fortunate that when you uh, step out. I, I remember one time we were in Romania and uh, uh, Jim and I were there. That's the time that the tanks came down the streets and stuff like that and all that. But it, it was really, really cold and really damp and sort of wet and had that little coal thing that you would heat up and put in that big furnace over on the side and we'd take turns sleeping by the, uh, by the furnace over there. And in order to be able to go to the restroom, you had to go out the back and you had to go down a little path and over on a corner over there. There's no lights in it. There's none of that. It's just very dark. So you had to carry a flashlight or a candle. And it's cold and kind of spitting snow a little bit and raining and, and that kind of thing. And so you're out there. And I was in there one time and something kept banging into that. And at first I thought, you know, Jim's cutting up and clowning around. I realized, no, he ain't stupid enough to come out in the pouring down rain just to mess with me. And then I thought, there's something in the bottom of this that's trying to get up to get me. Now I realize, but I'm in the land of, Trans I'm in the providence of Transylvania. And I had just been teaching on the things about the crucifixion and I brought up Vlad the Impaler. When they flipped out and the interpreter's looking at me like, you know, like, and I said, no, Vlad the Impaler and he impaled and he's like, you know, and he goes, that's the next mountain range over, man. That guy was bad and he was, he was horrible. Well, that was on my mind. So I'm thinking Vlad the Impaler has resurrected from the dead and he's coming up from, you know, out of that. I mean, I, it was a mindset and I realized it probably wasn't real. So I came running in the house and Lentz had gotten up and he said, what are you doing? I said, there is something out there. He goes, you're an idiot. And I said, will you go out there? He said, I ain't going out there. It's cold. I said, well, the time's going to come. You're going to go out there. So I'm telling you, something's out there in that hole. And he goes, well, I think you're crazy. Well, the time went on and he went out there. He came in white as a ghost. He's like, something's out there, man. I said, it's Vlad the Impaler. He's trying to get us. 
And so the long story short is we waited for the sun to come up. And when the sun came up, we're out there and we're kind of looking. Now, this is kind of gross, but you're looking at a outhouse and you're investigating. But we're not investigating to see whether or not it can be used. We're like, what is in here? What we didn't realize is, this is a little bit gross, the guy next door had built his pig farm and his little pig pen had backed up next to the, um, uh, uh, the back of the outhouse and it was the pig banging up against the outhouse because the pig was being disturbed. I guess my point is sometimes we take the benefits of flushing plumbing for granted. Forget I said all of that. <laughs> That's all you'll remember in the whole story now. <laughs> Sometimes you wake up in the morning and you can take a full deep breath. And you figure there's going to be plenty of breaths to come so you don't thank the Lord for the one that you did have. And sometimes, even though your eyes may be getting fuzzy, you're able to still be able to see and step without a cane and without walk. And I'm saying that sometimes when the Lord continues to provide those things, we begin to just sort of expect them to be there. And now they say we sort of take them for granted. Well, guess what happened? The brook dried up. It became a dry hole. The very place God had sent him to and promised to provide for him, all of a sudden the Lord turned off the spigot. The brook dried up, means there had been some water there for a while and now he could no longer get the water. And the indication is, because he's hungry by the time he gets here to Zarephath is, the ravens quit coming too. That's a difficult time even for an old preacher to say, okay, guess what? I guess it's time for me to uh, make some moves. Lord, what do you want me to do? Oh, I've already made provisions for you. I knew I was going to shut off the spigot. I knew I was going to uh, stop the food from coming. He said, what I want you to do is I want you to go down there. There's a woman down there. I've been talking to her for the last three and a half years. I've watched her. She's faithful. What does she do? She does pretty much the same thing on a daily basis. You'll find her. Uh, you, what is she going to be doing? Oh, she's going to be weeping. She's going to be crying. She's going to be moaning. She's going to be groaning. She's going to be complaining. Uh, she's going to be griping. She's going to be uh, on the doors of the, of the governmental offices wanting a handout. She's going to be doing that. Uh, he said, how am I going to know where to find her? Oh, she'll, you'll find her where she always is. What is it? She's just a faithful servant, just doing what she can. She'll just be gathering sticks. She'll just be getting some sticks together. Gathering sticks? What is she gathering sticks for? Well, don't worry about that. You wanted to know where she was. What's she going to be doing? She'll be gathering sticks. She's always gathering sticks. It doesn't make any difference. She's always down there gathering sticks. And so what I want you to do is go down and see her. Well, how am I going to know? What is her name? Find the one gathering the sticks. Which reminds me to say this, wouldn't it be something if we had Thomas's mentality about that Sunday night, remember, when the Lord showed up and Thomas decided of all the services to miss, he missed the one where the Lord showed up. Amen. I'm not trying to put you down or belittle you, but oftentimes it's like we think we know when God's going to show up and so we choose to miss the service and then invariably, as the old preacher used to say, it is almost amazing how many times individuals that needed exactly what they've been praying for miss the service where they would have gotten what they were praying for. Amen. What was she doing? He said, go over there, you'll find a woman. What's she going to be doing? She's picking up sticks. I've been talking to her. Why have I been talking to her? I know where to find her every day. It's not because I know everything, not because I see everything, not because I control everything. It's because I know where to find her because she's just a faithful older woman. Amen. Just doing what she can do. What? Taking care of her son. That's all she's doing. What do I do? I go over there. You know how the narrative goes in the story. And you know what happens is, is that she comes along there and Elijah walks in. And I think she maybe sees him coming down the road. And I think every day she looked down the road and said, I wonder if that's going to be the guy. I wonder if that's going to be the guy. I wonder if that's going to be the guy. When she sees Elijah, who's been in the wilderness for three years without a razor, without a pair of scissors, without a change of clothes, Drinking water and eating whatever the, the, the Lord provided with ravens, sleeping outside, 
Can you imagine what he looked like? You say, well, he must have had on wingtip shoes, you know, probably had some tassels on him. He had on a shirt and tie and had on a three-piece suit. And you could just tell by how he looked, he must have been the man of God. I think when he walked out of there, they thought, man, I don't know if that's Mark chapter 5, a demon-possessed man. I don't know. I don't have any idea who that is coming at me. I don't think when she looked up every day, she I wonder if that's him. I wonder if that's him. I think when he walked out, she goes, that can't be him. <laughs> Isn't it funny? Sometimes the individuals that God uses to bring a message to you, it doesn't really look like what you expected. Isn't it strange how sometimes that the Lord uses the most unusual vessels that He would even use any of us and it catches people off guard because they look at you, they're like, eh, can't be them. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, how you doing? The Lord told me to tell you. And they're like, really? And anyway, I think she looks down there and goes, yeah, that's not going him. She goes back to picking up sticks and Elijah says, uh, hey, how you doing? And she says, uh, I'm fine. I ain't got nothing for you to eat. Notice, look in the passage now, watch. Arise, get thee to Zarephath. Look, verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath and came upon the winter, winter woman there gathering sticks. Verse number 10, fetch me, I pray thee. And as she was going to feed, now in verse number 12, as the Lord thy God liveth. And she goes, okay. Not until he said, I'm the one the Lord's sending. She's just going, listen now, you got to get it. He said, can I get some water? That's the most valuable substance in Israel at the time. She is going to get him water not knowing he is the guy. Which lets me know that this woman is unusual because she's there to help anybody with whatever she has to help with. She's going to get him. The Lord didn't say, that's the guy. The guy just comes by and says, hey, can I get some water? She's going to get some water. She doesn't say to him, are you the preacher I'm looking for? I, listen, I only have a little bit of bread left. I'm supposed to be feeding you. God told me you were coming this way. I've had a vision. I've had a, uh, this. He, she doesn't say that. She goes and she starts to get the water and says, hey, uh, how about some bread and he said as the Lord God liveth and she goes y you're the guy <laughs> and so you know what she does he says uh, well I just want to say this to you there preacher uh, I've only got enough to make a little cake for me and my boy we're gonna eat it and we're gonna die it doesn't mean we're gonna eat it and die immediately it means that's gonna be the last meal we're gonna starve to death <laughs> isn't it funny how with the last morsel of bread the Lord all of a sudden puts all these chess pieces into place, dries up the brook, stops the ravens, gets Elijah to go from where he was by the brook Cherith to Zarephath, which is a distance of a few miles there, and times that whole thing down. Now think about the timing of this, because if he had showed up 20 minutes later, the bread would have already been eaten. If he'd have shown up the day after, there would have been no meal in the barrel. Right? If he'd have showed up before the time was over with without turning everything off, in other words, on his own, he just decided the timing would have been off. Isn't it interesting, I'd like to say this, that it always seems to be at the last possible minute that the Lord comes walking on the water and not right when you're done, you're through, you're about to throw the oars in the boat. I can't take no more. I'm done. I, my brook has dried up. Them ravens have quit coming. I'm finished. I'm over. I'm done with. And the Lord walks in and said, hey, how are you doing? How, are you having a good day today? <laughs> I mean, Paul and Silas are in Acts 16. They're back in the prison in the darkest place back there. They have been beaten to within an inch of their life. And it looks like pretty much their goose is cooked. And Paul, of course, is ready to go at any moment. And Silas is sitting there thinking, my aching back. And Paul says to him, he says, you know something? This is as good a place as any for us to sing a hymn. And Silas has got to be thinking, listen, old man, you, you, you're, you've lost your mind. This is not what I signed on for. Me being tied up with you has... I, you don't hear of a sermon Silas has preached. You don't see where Silas has done anything. You know what got Silas beaten? His affiliation with Paul. Paul was the one doing all the talking, but they just assumed because Silas was with Paul, he believed the same way. They got two for one deal. They go ahead and beat Silas too at the same time they beat Paul. Paul's the one doing all that. And Paul's the one now saying to Silas instead of, hey man, sorry you took one for the team and I'm really sorry that happened to you. He said, man, ain't this great, man? I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. Let's sing a song. <laughs> Silas has got to be going, 
you're kidding me, man. I'm sitting here in prison because of you. And you know what happens, and Paul begins to sing, praise the Lord for full salvation. God is still upon the throne. And we know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain is gone. <laughs> Ain't this a blessing, boy? Praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, the earthquake starts. The walls begin to shake. Now, look, if I'm Silas, here's what I'm thinking. Great. Now I'm chained to a wall and the stones are going to fall on me and I'm going to be in here locked in. I'm claustrophobic already. Nothing but my eyeballs moving and I got rocks on me and they are not going to bother to dig me out. I am going to starve to death after being crushed by a bunch of rocks. Thanks, Paul. I've heard of bad singing before, but my goodness, man, that takes the cake. You start singing instead of breaking a glass, you're making the walls shake. Could you shut up? And about that time, their chains fall off. And Silas goes, hey man, now's our chance. Let's go. Paul said, let's don't. He's like, you have lost your mind, old man. We got a chance to go. The door is open. Paul says, yeah, but every open door is not an opportunity, Silas. Just because the door's open doesn't mean that God opened the door for us to escape. God's opened the door because the reason he put us here, Silas, is to reach the one that put us here. Wait a minute, Paul. The reason he put us here is to reach the one that put us here. You're telling me this whole thing is the will of God. Yeah, it, we, he put us by the brook Cherith. This is what we're supposed to do. This is going to be great, man. Man, I can't wait. And all of a sudden, the other prisoners are breaking out. And Paul goes, y'all don't go nowhere. Yeah. You ever think about this? Paul must have had some street cred because they didn't leave. Right. Yeah. That's some bad cats that are in there. And so the jailer shows up, and of all the places that he could show up, he goes to the Apostle Paul's cell first. Why? That would have been the furthest back on the line of cells. It would have been the deepest, darkest hole in the dungeon. And he figured, well, I'll go all the way back there. And he's about to fall on his sword, and Paul steps into the light of that torch, and he said, hey, man, don't kill yourself. We're all right here. What do you mean you're right here? He said, well, we're, we're right here. You don't have to kill yourself. I know Roman law. I know that if your prisoners escape, that it, you have to die. I realize you're about to commit suicide because you think we've all escaped. It must be perplexing to you right now. You've got to be scratching your proverbial head, thinking to yourself, well, I know what I would do if I was in prison. I know what I would do if I had been put back there. I would probably, on my way out the door, kill the jailer that put me there. I know what I would do. Paul said, well, I ain't you. I'm thinking that's what he's thinking. And Paul says, hey, let me just tell you, we didn't escape because we're saved. The guys go, man, I got to have what you got. He said, how, how can I get that? And he said, well, then it's kind of a long story. He said, would you mind coming to dinner with me? A prisoner. Would you mind coming to dinner with me? Uh, take you down to the house and... Wife will take care of those. I sure am sorry about that, Paul. I, I'm the one that hurt you. I'm the one that put you in jail. I'm the one that put your feet in stocks and your arms in chains. I'm the one that had you whipped. I was in charge of that. I, they had a seat in first class, but I put you back in steerage. I, I, I'm the one that I, 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 I did that, Paul. Paul said, no, no, you didn't. He said, let me ask you a question. You ever heard the story of Joseph? He said, the story of Joseph. He said, yeah, you know, how his brothers, you know, they threw him in prison. And then he went out there later on and went to Potiphar's house and wound up in the jail and then wound up in, in, the, in the palace and that kind of thing. And God said, no, I never heard that kind of stuff. He said, you know, it's interesting how that story ends up there. He has an opportunity there with all of his brothers there in front of him. He has the chance to kill every one of them. But you know what? He looks at his brothers. He said, hey, y'all meant it for evil. No question about that. But God meant it for good. Amen. He said, man, I never heard no story like that. And I said, well, see, there was a guy here that got hung on a cross. And oh, that jailer said, oh, oh, man, I heard about that. Yeah, I, oh, man, I heard that was a bad one, man. Everybody's talking about that one. I, he, Paul said, well, why is that? He said, they knew that guy was innocent, man. They knew that guy was innocent. Everybody in here knew that guy was innocent. 
knew he wasn't the rabble rouser. They knew who it was behind the scenes pulling the strings and doing the stuff, man. I mean, they knew about the conspiracy, the whole nine yards, man. They treated that man worse than you'd treat a stray dog. Man, it was unbelievable. And he said, did you know what that guy said? The last couple of things he said, he said something about for, forgive him. Paul said, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> He said, you see what the nation of Israel and all y'all meant for evil, God meant for good. He said, that's the Lord who's in charge of the corn crib and he wants to dispense something to you and give something to you in your time of need. And he said, I'd like to have more about that and sit down there and they got roast lamb and taters and rice and gravy and key lime pie and ice cream and all the good trimmings that are up there, cinnamon rolls big as your head and half a pound of bacon or, 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 or lamb chops there piled up and those kind of things. And Paul's sitting there and Silas is going, man, he's scratching his head. I don't get it, man. I mean, just an hour or two ago, we're sitting in prison. I'm griping and complaining. And now I'm sitting here and the guy who put me in prison, I'm in his house and he's treating me like a king and I'm eating his food and his kids are, are cleaning my wounds up and helping me. Man, Lord, I, I thought, Paul said, you know what happens sometimes? The brook dries up. Lord provides you another place to go. <laughs> Which would you rather have? And he said, I kind of like this one better than I like that one over there. He says, yeah, but this one makes you more appreciative. It makes, that one makes you more appreciative. This one don't. Silas said, I think I'm getting it. After a while, that jailer's convinced. You know the story. You know what he says. He said, man, I sure would like to get in on that. And Paul said, well, all you have to do, he said, you can be saved in your whole household if you're willing to get in. Amen. You say, what happened? The Lord made a provision, but it looked like the brook was dried up. Right. All throughout the Bible, it's that way. Well, here comes Elijah. He shows up out there and the woman's up there picking up sticks. She's got just enough to make a little cake. I'm just saying, make the size of a rice cake. It wasn't no cat head. It wasn't no, no, no big old cat head with five slabs of butter on it. Just a, just a little old, we're going to eat that and we're going to die. It's not going to last us long. They're already close to death as it is. Do you see the timing of the thing? Sure. Do you see how oftentimes it's right when you think God hasn't heard you that the Lord then will step in and say, I've been hearing you the whole time. I was just waiting for the right time. Sometimes if the Lord shows up too soon, we have to be that falling off the root syndrome. You know, it's kind of like, never mind, Lord, the nail caught me. Yeah. Sometimes he has to wait to the last minute for our benefit or we'll give somebody else the glory for getting us out of the mess. You know, the check will come in the mail or the situation will straighten it out. Or never, never mind, you won't see that as the Lord sending a raven and dropping it in your plate like this. Oh, but when it happens like that, you realize there's something supernatural that just took place. Something you didn't expect, God shows up and shows you a handful of purpose and he does it to show you, I've been watching you, I know where you are, I know what's going on. I know, ladies and gentlemen, you get to a point sometimes where you wonder if God cares. You wonder if God hears. You wonder if God sees. I know sometimes you think he must be blind as a bat flying backwards because he can't see what's going on and the trouble that you're in. He must be past feeling. There doesn't seem to be any emotion. He doesn't seem to show you anything that indicates that he cares about you. Sometimes you think he's a paralytic because he won't walk to you when you need him to walk to you or pick you up when you need him to hold you. I know how that feels, but sometimes he waits until the last minute to say, hey, listen, I got a biscuit waiting for you and it's going to come from a really unusual source. I'm not sending you back to the king's palace to get a big meal. I'm sending you to an old woman. I wondered sometime when I read that story, I think to myself, how that woman must have felt that of all the people that got the privilege of feeding that old prophet, that she got the privilege of having her name, though nameless, anonymity, her name in that book saying, I'm the one that fed the preacher. God saw fit to let me feed him. Amen. That's not self-serving. That's the prophet of God. That's God just rewarding what? Faithfulness. She never preached a sermon. She never sang a song. She didn't teach a Sunday school class. She obviously had no money to tithe. All she did was pick up sticks and make bread. And the Lord said, you know what? I know one thing about this woman. She's going to be picking up sticks and making bread. And of all the people he could have chosen, he said, that one right there, what's her name? She's not even mentioned. 
I wondered sometimes, the Bible says in the New Testament that when the Lord gets ready to come, will he find anybody still faithful? You say, why well, faithfulness matters. I had a little girl come up to me at camp this week and she told me all the things she couldn't do. She's not as talented. She's not as pretty. She doesn't have the ability to play an instrument. She can't sing a song. She, her words, not mine. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. And she said, I really don't have a whole lot of, she called it book learning knowledge. I don't, I, I don't, I don't. She goes, I do. I don't know what I can do. I, she goes, I can't draw. I can't. She said, I know this girl and man, she's an artist and she can draw and she draws all these beautiful pictures and stuff. She goes, I can't do, I can't do that. She goes, I said, well, tell me what you do. She goes, well, I, I go to church. I, I do read my Bible. I said, I do pray. I said, oh, I know who you are. She said, who? I said, you're the woman of Zeropath. She said, what does that mean? I said, I've been watching you. You up here, you get a flask water, you do that. You pick up trash off the floor. Everybody walk, I watch five people walk by. I mean, I maybe set it up a little bit, put some trash out there, and I just sit by and watch. I watch a bunch of people walk by, and I watch her walk by. And invariably, she walked by, and she'll pick that up. And finds a garbage can, puts it in the garbage can. You say, what's the big deal? Oh, it's huge. You say, why? I know when the Lord is looking for a prophet to be fed, I know who he's going to call on. That little old trash picker upper. Yeah. I could pick her out of a lineup. I don't remember her name. She didn't tell me her name. She just said, oh, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, let me ask you this. Are you faithful to do what you feel God's told you to do? She goes, oh, yes, sir. I, I do the best I can. Well, whatever big old wild eyes, you know, she's just, yes, sir. I, I try to do whatever he tells me to do. I said, then you're doing all you can do. Amen. And she goes, do you mean that the Lord will reward me for just being faithful? I said, absolutely, I believe that the Lord will reward you for just being faithful. I said, listen, the Bible says Mary did what she could. What did she do? She goes, are you talking about, she's, she knows the Bible. She's like, you know, she's having this theological conversation. She feels like she's, uh, you know, sitting down and, and she goes, well, you know, Mary, that's the one who was with Martha. That was her sister. And, uh, and I said, did you cook a meal? She goes, I don't think, I heard the sermon you preached and said she must not have been good in the kitchen. She must have burned stuff because Martha never wanted her in the kitchen just to clean up the, I said, okay, so she didn't cook a meal. I said, did she wash any dishes? She said, I don't know. I said, did she sing a song? I don't know. Did she preach a sermon? She goes, no, now preacher, you know that women can't be preachers. I said, okay. I said, so what did she do? And she goes, well, I guess she didn't do anything. I said, no, you're wrong. Oh man, it's like I smacked her. She's like, what do you mean I'm wrong? I said, the Bible says she did what she could. Amen. And she goes, oh yeah. I said, what was what she could? I said, you don't know. We know she broke the alabaster box, but she did what she could. It's more than that. What was it? I don't know. I said, can you just do what you can? She, man, she lit up like a Christmas tree on Christmas Eve, man. She was like, you mean the Lord would maybe just reward me for just being faithful? And I said, yes, I do. She's like, oh, I know why I came to camp. She lit up, man. I mean, I'm preaching on all this bad stuff and all this wickedness and all this sin. And she's sitting there, man, like, okay, could you preach to me? Because I don't do all that stuff. I mean, like you can look at her face and you, she's like just, just clean, you know, just, she's just glowing. She's just innocent, dumb as a box of rocks when it comes to stuff. She's like, I said, uh, talking to her, I said, do you know anything about the internet? She goes, well, I know that's one of them things that she get on and get in trouble. <laughs> I was like, okay. I felt like I was back in Romania. They're telling me, you got to back up a little bit. You're not far enough along. I said... Okay, well, that's good. I said, well, you do uh, school and stuff like that? She says, yes, her books and workbook and so on and so forth. And I go to such and such a school. I said, okay. I said, well, eventually when that comes on, as I began to talk to her, I realized she didn't even know modern lingo. Pretty little girl, innocent as a driven snow. You know what she was worried about? I can't play a cello. I can't write. I can't sing. I, I can't draw. 
What can I do? <laughs> I don't know, sister, but I'll tell you this. Whoever your pastor is, you're a blessing to him because every time the door is open, you are sitting right there in the congregation just doing what you can. Let me hurry to the story here because I don't want to keep you too much past 12 o'clock. Listen. The Lord says, of all the people that I could pick, I just picked some nondescript woman who's doing a nondescript thing. Just picking up sticks. You know what I see in that? I see faithfulness to a personal responsibility. Before you can minister to other people, you just have to be faithful to do what God's called you to do. Yes, yes. So that's kind of juvenile preacher. Well, but that's where it starts. If you're not faithful to do what you can do, why do you think the Lord's going to put you in charge of a whole bunch of other things to do? It's like, can you just do what you What are you doing? Picking up sticks? Who wants to pick up sticks? Oh, I'm so glad that you asked. It's actually part of the outline. Because I found another place where there was a guy picking up sticks. He was a great man, not a nondescript man. I mean, he was a guy that had a lot of prominence. He was a guy who at one time was considered to be like the chief of the police or the, or the district attorney. He was trained at the feet of Gamil. He was above the law, a Pharisee of Pharisees, above the law, blameless. I mean, he had everything there was. The Lord changed his name from Saul to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul, you read 13 of his epistles that are there now in 2022, written all that time ago, and is responsible for us following after him as he follows after Christ. I would say he had a name and he did a lot. Amen. What was he doing? Picking up sticks. Why? Because some people were cold and hungry. Paul never got so far ahead in his mind being so good at what he did theologically and doctrinally. Paul was the equivalent of a scholar. He could write. He could have people write for him. He was in touch with God. Spent three years on the backside in the Arabian desert. Paul was in touch with God. Paul was a somebody. Amen. What is he doing? Shipwrecked. He tells the guys, follow me. Gives them pieces of the ship. They all get up there. Everybody else is standing around freezing. What's Paul doing? Looking for something to do. Not waiting for somebody to take care of him. What's he doing? Picking up sticks. That's insane. You just involved, survived a shipwreck, Paul. What are you doing? I don't know. People are cold and so am I. Somebody's got to get some wood for the fire. Amen. You know, the difference this time is, is that she's picking up sticks to build a fire so that she can cook something to eat. Paul's picking up sticks and before he can get them on the fire, a snake bites him. Right. <laughs> Say this to you, Christian, sometimes you really are trying to be a help to other people. And you're picking up sticks to build a fire, to warm them, and to feed them. And guess what happens? One of them sticks bites you. Amen. You say, what did Paul do? Paul said to all them after he dropped the pile of sticks on the ground, this is what I get for trying to help you. This is what I get. If it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't have survived the stinking shipwreck. If it hadn't have been for me, your tummy wouldn't have been full because we wouldn't have eaten before we got in the water. If it hadn't been for me, you people jumping on the boat would have all drowned, let alone the other people that are out there. And this is what I get. I get snake bit. God, you sure got a funny way of rewarding your servants. No, the Bible said the Apostle Paul... He, threw them sticks on the fire and, and shook the thing into the fire like that where it belonged. And now they're all watching because you know what the Bible says in that passage in the book of Acts? You remember it, Acts 28? Remember what happens? The Bible says they watched him because he should have swole up. Can I make just an emotional d illustration of that? The natural response to being hurt is, I ain't going to that church no more. Bunch of snakes biting me. You know what it said? He should have swole up. They're watching him. He didn't swell up. That's good. Amen. You say, why? Because he never realized it. He realized it was never about him in the first place. Amen. 
They're looking at him. They're going, man, that was a two-step mamba. He's going to go two-step. He must have been a murderer. They're talking about him. Yep. Paul said, yep. I sure was. You were a murderer? Yeah. Yeah, I was. I killed people for the wrong reason. Religious zeal got me in a lot of trouble. So you deserve a snake bite. Oh, I deserve more than that. Why aren't you bitter that snake bit you and you're trying to take care of us? No. As a matter of fact, I was hoping it might work. I wonder sometime if I could paint. If I could paint, I'd have Paul glaring into that. He'd look at a stack of wood over there and he'd look at a stack of wood over there and he'd look at a stack of wood over there. He goes, that's the one right there. He saw the snake in there and he's thinking, man, if I can get that thing to bite me. No, Paul knew he still had preaching to do. And he shook it off. You know what they said? There's something different about that guy. You know what the Philippian jailer said about Paul and Silas? There's something different Amen. about that Amen. guy. You know what that old preacher thought when he saw that woman? There's something different about her. She's over here gathering up some sticks so she can make a fire. And he says this to her, as the Lord God liveth. And she goes, you're the guy. Boy, the Lord sure knows how to be funny, man. How to never thought... Somebody that looks like you would ever be the one to be delivering the message to the king. Boy, I'm going to tell you what, man. I can't wait to see what God's going to do with you. He said, tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll continue to gather the sticks and make the fire. You know what she doesn't say? Well, preacher, I'll be glad to. How about you start the fire and get the pan and grease it up and all that kind of stuff? She don't say that. She makes him a cake. Just a little small one. And in so doing... If you read the next part of the verse, her and her son ate also because the barrel never ran dry and neither did the oil, but not until she did what God told her to do in the first place. It wasn't about feeding the preacher. It was about doing what God said to do. The message is not about feeding the preacher. The preacher has been eating quite well. Thank you. It's not about feeding the preacher. It's about being obedient to the little things. So of all the people that he could pick, he picked a woman that is gathering sticks. Everybody's gathering sticks. Something special about her. But watch, the story's not over. In the story, you find that after the bread and the meal, I mean, the meal's not gone out and the oil's not depleted, Right? Looks like, hey, we've written off the end of that story. But guess what happens? The very one that God has used to provide for someone else, Elijah, the very one who God has used and has been talking to, her son died. <laughs> Don't you find that strange? You know, the first thing, the, this is the heart of the woman coming out. Now, there's nothing in the passage at all that is going to explain what she's fixing to say. There's no description. She's not a woman of ill repute. She's not somebody that's out doing things she ought not be doing. There's no record of any wrongdoing. As soon as that boy dies, she goes to the preacher. Look in the passage. You know what she says? Have you come here to call my sin to remembrance? The first thing she says is, what's wrong with me? That shows you the heart of the servant. What's wrong with me? What have I done? Yeah, you know, that's how God is. Yeah, he punishes and uses. Oh, okay, I, look, I can't help you with your bitterness. You're not going to hear anything else I'm going to say. I'm trying to point out the heart of a faithful woman, and you don't really see her heart until she gets under pressure. And under pressure, you finally see the real heart of the woman. You know what she says? Huh. I'm no different than anybody else. I deserve it just like anybody else deserve it. Preacher, I want to ask you a question. Did you come to call my sin to remembrance? And the preacher says, I'm going to paraphrase. He said, well, why would you say that? My boy died. Why, why? I, 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 I realize that we were, he was going to die anyway. We were going to eat and then he was going to die. But now my needs are met. I'm not planning on him dying now. She had made preparations for him to die before, I and the lad are going to eat and die. Right? Now her provisions are met. 
So she's making the assumption, oh yeah, well he's not going to die now. Yeah, that's good. Well, life and death wasn't in the meal. Right. Or the bread provided. Life and death was in the hand of God. Amen. Why did he die? Doesn't say. But the first thing she says is, is what I do wrong? That's a good place to start. Well, let me hurry. He said, where's a boy? <laughs> do you honestly think that she could have given him her boy in that condition if she hadn't have given him the biscuit first? If she hadn't trusted God to provide meal and oil, do you think she could have trusted God to provide life to her boy? The biscuit had to come first. She takes that limp, lifeless little boy who's been laid now up in a bed and all of her thoughts, all of her dreams, all of her memories, everything she's had wrapped up in that boy is laying there. The next part of the passage, the Bible says Elijah goes in. I like this part. He closes the door. Preacher, why is that important? Well, <laughs> some things need to be done in private. Everybody doesn't need to know what happens behind closed doors. And the Bible said he laid on top of the boy and he cried. So, well, he's talking about the volume of his voice and he's talking about, no, he's crying. You say, well, I think the heart of that preacher has been touched. Lord, you used her to help me. And this had to happen to her, and I think it hurt him as if that was his own kid. I think his crying there between his prayers were sincere tears. But your Bible student, Brother Mitch, should check and make sure, did the boy get up after one prayer? You know what I like about that preacher? He didn't quit. You say, what? Lord, if that old woman can be faithful to pick up sticks to feed me when I'm hungry. I know you didn't hear me the first time. Let's give it another try. And he cries more and he cries louder. And the boy don't get up. Can I say this? Can you imagine how that mama must have felt outside that door? She hasn't heard her boy say, Mama. She ain't heard a boy say, I'm hungry. She ain't heard a boy say, Get off me, old man. <laughs> he ain't heard nothing. She's not listening for the prayer of Elijah. She's listening for the voice of the boy. Amen. Ears by the door. She's listening through the keyhole. I think she's probably praying at the same time. Don't say so. Elijah dries up his tears, sucks up the snot, he looks at the boy, still just as lifeless. And Elijah walked out the door and said, I'm sorry, I've, I've done all I can do. Prepare the coffin. No. He went back at it again. That's a real preacher. That's a real Christian. Amen. I ain't quitting just because it gets hard. Amen. But you understand, his heart is breaking on the behalf of someone else. It doesn't affect him one way or the other. It's not going to change his ministry. He's interested in the one. He's not praying for the nation. He hasn't even gone to Carmel yet. It's just one. Lord, that woman's my friend. That woman fed me when I was hungry. That woman had faith to believe you and trust me. And give me that. Lord, can you do something for her? It doesn't bolster him. In the passages, nobody else even knows. It's just her, him, and the boy. 
Because sometimes God does things in private that He don't let everybody know about in public. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad you can come and say, Lord, can you resurrect me? Man, what I've done is, oh, it's bad. And the Lord breathed breast in your nostrils. And you become a living soul again. Aren't you glad that he doesn't go tell everybody, hey, let me tell you what Peacock did. And he stretches himself out again, hand to hand, feet to feet, mouth to his mouth, and breathes into him. Boy, wake up! And the boy, I think if I'm keeping context, the first thing he says is, I'm hungry. <laughs> and Elijah said, he's back. What happens to the woman? What happens to her son? You can spend some time looking. Doesn't say. Sooner or later, they passed away. Sooner or later, they were in the arms of Jesus. In those days, they would have been in paradise. Sooner or later, probably the mama would have gone first and then the daddy. But I would be willing to say this, maybe. Who's your mama? She's a stick picker upper. But you know what? Because she could pick up sticks effectively, the Lord saw fit to send an old preacher by. And she knew a little bit about cooking, made him something to eat. Why are you telling the story? I'd be dead if it hadn't been for that preacher. Here's what you miss in the story the Lord knew the boy was going to die. So he let the brook dry up. And he let the ravens stop. And he let it be their last meal. But the boy knew she was going to need supernatural intervention. So he sent a preacher. And he said, hey, it's time for the three and a half years to pass. There's somebody I want to help. And they're going to need you. The Lord knew out there. I'm going to need you out here, Elijah. So I'll tell you what. Better do what I tell you to do. See, you never know. When God sends you to do what appears to be the most mundane of tasks. You never know when God's saying, I'm just needing you to be in the right place at the right time. Because I already know what's going to happen. I'm providing for you. You don't even know I'm providing. We see the bread in the passage and the fire in the passage. But you don't see the supernatural hand of God in the passage until the boy dies. We think that Elijah is just making his way to the palace. But he made a detour along the way. And he went by. Why? He didn't have to have a meal there. Because he said, hey, can you do something for me, ma'am? Can you help me out? Sure, Lord. What you want me to do? God preacher coming by. <laughs> Give him some water and a biscuit. Okay. Why? Because I know what you're going to need later. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what your expectations are. I know this, that no matter how mundane it is and how small you might think it to be, you know what the Lord's looking at? He's saying, hey, I just need somebody to be in the right place at the right time and be willing to do what I need them to do, even if you don't understand the benefit of picking up sticks. Lord, I'm just picking up sticks. The Lord said, yeah, but you know what I know? I know where to find you when I need you. Of all the trips, now think about it a minute, because it's odd. Why does he send him from the brook to Zarephath before he goes to the palace? Why didn't he just send him to confront Ahab and then move on from there? Because supernaturally the Lord put him there just to make a detour for that woman who picked up sticks, who had a need she didn't even know she had. Heavenly Father, would you please help us this morning as we consider the woman of Zarephath. Lord, might you help us this morning to 
pause and to reflect upon how many times you've done things in our lives and we get oftentimes overwhelmed with the mundane, the routine of the task at hand. Help us to recognize that you can even use somebody that's willing to pick up sticks to get supernatural things done. Lord, I have no doubt there are people here that have a multiplicity of questions. They're going through troubles and trials and fears and anxieties, and they're very, very real. If there ever was a time of spiritual famine in our land, it is today. I pray, Lord, that you will do what only you can do, supernaturally help them to trust you while they continue the task of picking up sticks. We'd ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Joni's going to come and play. Heads are